committee will come to order. Good morning and thank you for being here today. Eight months ago, the American taxpayers came to the rescue of AIG with an $85 billion bailout. That was followed by more money in November, more again in December, and more money still in March. The taxpayers have now provided more than $180 billion in financial assistance to AIG. Yet much of what has been done with that money has been done in the dark. In fact, the one thing that stands out most about the collapse and federal rescue of AIG is the shroud of secrecy that has blanketed the entire sequence of events. This secrecy has only made the situation worse. I get the sense when I talk to people back home in Brooklyn, they simply don't understand what happened. And let me point out, they don't like the idea that their tax dollars are being used to bail out a big business. They want to believe that this federal bailout is necessary, but they wonder whether the money is being used wisely. And they want assurances that ultimately they are going to get their money back. What is the plan to repay the American people? And does it have a realistic chance of working? Are the trustees adequately protecting the interests of the American people? In my view, AIG needs to demonstrate that it is headed in the right direction. We need to understand what the long range plan is for AIG. Are you going to liquidate it or are you going to restructure it in such a way as to return it to profitability and repay the taxpayers' investment? According to testimony we will hear today, AIG plans to liquidate much of the company and spin off its insurance assets. Does liquidating the assets in the midst of a bear more market makes sense? Will this plan maximize the returns of the company in today's economic climate? We know AIG agreed to sell their auto insurance unit. We hear they are negotiating the sale of their Tokyo headquarters building, a unique property adjacent to the Imperial Palace. Will the taxpayers get the best return on their investment? by selling a premier property during the worst commercial real estate market <laughs> in years. A few days ago, we learned that AIG has put together a plan called Project Destiny. Project Destiny is described as a multi-year roadmap for the restructuring of AIG. I requested a copy of this plan but AIG says that disclosing the plan would undermine its efforts to achieve its goal for the benefit of American taxpayers. AIG says it is consulting on the issue with the New York's feds. In other words, trust us, don't rush us. Everything will be all right. But everything is not all right. People in my district and throughout the country are hurting Yet AIG has spent millions of dollars on high-priced PR firms and big-time lawyers to attack its critics. AIG is paying PR executives as much as $600 an hour in taxpayer dollars. Clearly, AIG is making sure its lawyers and PR firms are watching its back. But who is watching the backs of the American people, the taxpayers? What should the American people think when millions of dollars in bonuses are paid to the very people who cause AIG's problems in the first place? Less than a week ago, the AIG trustees still felt it necessary to write to Mr. Liddy 
and urge him to get executive compensation under control. I am surprised and disappointed to see that AIG continues to argue for secrecy. In, this te in his testimony, Mr. Liddy seems to argue that criticism of AIG will somehow hurt the company. Again, we are hearing trust us, but we are not willing to let $180 billion go on trust us. We will question, we will inquire, we will verify, and we will not hesitate to probe every aspect of AIG's management and operations to protect the taxpayer's investment. It is our responsibility to ensure that those public monies are spent wisely, legally, and in the best interest of the American people. And we will continue to do just that. The question we are raising today should be easy enough to answer, but unfortunately AIG has failed to fully respond to straightforward requests for information. This cannot continue. As AIG moves forward, it has to know that Main Street is just as important as Wall Street. I'm looking forward to hearing today from Mr. Liddy and also the AIG trustees. On that note, I now yield to the ranking member, Congressman Issa from the state of Florida, uh, California. Maybe Florida someday, Chairman. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and thank you for facilitating this hearing today uh, over the administration's management of $190 billion in bailout money. I think it's reasonable to, uh, to say that most Americans, even Bill Gates, cannot break $190 billion down into a meaningful increment. So <clears throat> hopefully accurately, I divided the 300 million or so Americans into that and found it's about $633 for every man, woman, and child in this country, plus or minus the latest census. Mr. Chairman, I voted against these bailouts. However, I'm in the minority, so I have to accept the policies given to me until the American people get their chance to vote on a different policy. And I have an opportunity as the ranking member to demand transparency and accountability on behalf of the American people who have a right to know how their money is being spent. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for being an equal partner in ensuring that we have that opportunity on a bipartisan basis in this important investigation. Ensuring transparency and accountability for the more than $190 billion of taxpayers' money injected into AIG is a key component of this committee's responsibilities. Just last week, we learned AIG paid $454 million in bonuses to its employees in 2008. Well, in March, we were told it was only $120 million. Well, I understand that there is confusion, and there may, that may be that, in fact, the blame is based on different questions asked to different people in the process of getting the information, this confusion illustrates as much the serious problem in government trying to manage a company this large and this complex. The continued lack of transparency in this administration's bailouts adventures, and I must admit, much like the previous administration, caused me to say, how dare we find out drip by drip by drip that our government has no ability to say how much money has been spent or on what. How much longer can the American people tolerate the lack of transparency? I am pleased that Mr. Liddy is here today, and I want to acknowledge that he did not create the problems at AIG, but instead has taken on the very difficult challenge of unwinding an incredibly complex company while facing tremendous scrutiny from the public and from those of us here in Congress. I want to personally say to Mr. Liddy, today we will make every effort to make this about how we can work together better, how we can achieve the transparency the American people are entitled to, and how we can do no harm to your efforts to maximize the return to all the stockholders of AIG, and particularly we are going to be asking about the 80 percent that the American people own. 
Mr. Chairman, President Obama has promised the American people unprecedented level of transparency and accountability. And I see our role on the committee as one of holding the President to that promise. And that includes understanding the role of the three powerful individuals who now head the AIG Trust. As des designed by uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner when he ran the New York Fed, I believe that this trust is inherently unconstitutional, unaccountable entity that manages the taxpayers' investments in AIG, not for the taxpayers, but in the name of the interest of the, but in the interest of the federal government, specifically the U.S. Treasury. It is important to remember, Mr. Chairman, that those are two things are not one and the same. The U.S. Treasury is, in fact, not the same as the American people who have invested $633 for every man, woman, and child into this company. I want to acknowledge also that for the second panel, the trustees, they did not create this problem, and we, they will not be held accountable for what was created. However, since they now control 80 percent of the stock of AIG on behalf of, I believe, should be the American people and not just the best interest of the Treasury, we must question why AIG trustees are immune from legal, legal liability so long as they act in the best interest of the Treasury and are indemnified against any loss, cost, or expense of any kind or character whatsoever. Who can doubt, Mr. Chairman, in light of recent public bullying of Chrysler bondholders who were derided as speculators by President Obama that these clauses insulate the trustees from the normal accountability and transparency we demand of all our representatives? The New York Times recently reported that this unprecedented trust structure provides cover for officials who, despite the government's large stake in various banks, want to preserve the notion that neither the Treasury nor the Fed owns AIG or, or controls any banks. Mr. Chairman, I would submit that this is, an in, this is inappropriate for regulators and bureaucrats to use this legal sleight of hand to obscure the influence in running the U.S. financial sector. The American people have a right to know what is being done with their money and how these companies are being run. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to our witnesses. I appreciate your indulgence and would ask uh, that additional material be placed in the record so as to preserve time and yield back. Without objection. Thank you very much, um, Congressman Issa. Uh, I now ask unanimous consent to leave the record open uh, to members may submit their opening remarks and questions for the record and uh, we will leave the record open for that. At this time, I would like to ask our witness to please stand. We swear in all of our witnesses. Do you agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that he answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. I'm sorry. We have the lights here. I'm sorry. Uh, and that, of course, we start out as on green, and then it goes to yellow, and then it's red. So when it gets on yellow, you can start trying to wrap up, and which will allow all the members an opportunity to raise questions. And maybe something that you didn't say, you get a chance to say it during the questioning period. Okay. You may begin. Better? Sorry. Let me start over. You'll Mr. never Chairman. be misquoted until you turn it on. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member is a members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. I appreciate the opportunity to describe for the committee the business plan we are executing in order to put AIG's troubles behind it, to repay the monies that we owe the American taxpayer, and to secure an outcome that helps to put the American economy back on track. We are working hard to determine the destiny of the component parts of AIG. Our plan contemplates that AIG's best businesses will establish separate identities from the parent holding company. The parent company will become smaller. The financial products unit will cease to exist. How long the plan will ultimately take will very much depend on how quickly 
and how strongly the global economy recovers. But let me be clear. Our plan is explicitly designed to avoid having to divest AIG assets at fire sale prices. Just the opposite is true. We intend for taxpayers to realize the fullest possible value from every asset disposition, and we have already made substantial progress in this restructuring. We have reduced, but not yet eliminated, the systemic risk that AIG presents to the global financial system. We are selling assets where possible, despite adverse conditions in global financial markets. We are stabilizing AIG's liquidity so that we do not need support beyond those amounts already authorized by the government, although, as I've, I've said, the economy will be a factor in this. And we are restructuring some businesses for public offerings. We are restructuring other businesses for later disposition or to be wound down so that future losses can be mitigated or avoided. Across these four areas, we have in recent weeks achieved a number of important milestones. We are transferring two major foreign life insurance companies, Alico and AIA, into special purpose vehicles in exchange for a substantial reduction in AIG's debt to the Federal Reserve. We expect to complete the contractual arrangements for these transfers in the near future. We are also transferring the global property and casualty insurance franchise, known as AIU Holdings, into an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. This will secure the value of that very substantial business in preparation for the potential sale of a minority stake, which ultimately may include a public offering of shares, again, depending upon market conditions. And we continue to make significant progress in winding down AIG financial products. We have reduced the FP risk positions from 44,000 to 27,000, and we've reduced the notional exposure from a peak of approximately 2.7 trillion to just under 1.5 trillion today. We continue to weigh every action with several criteria in mind. Will it reduce systemic risk? Is it the best use of federal assistance? Will it enhance our ability to pay back the government? Does it keep our insurance businesses strong and well capitalized? And does it protect our policyholders? We are working hard to improve governance at the company. AIG is an incredibly complex entity with over 4,000 legal entities, cross ownership, and a myriad of special purpose structures. Our restructuring plan must make AIG less complicated, less risky, and more transparent. The infusion of government capital to AIG brought with it a substantial new set of relationships with the American taxpayer as AIG's largest single shareholder, with the taxpayer's representatives here in Congress, with the Federal Reserve and U.S. Treasury, and more recently with the trustees also appearing today. These relationships are new and in many ways unprecedented. We work closely with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the U.S. Treasury. Representatives of the Fed and Treasury and their advisors are engaged with various AIG offices every day. We view them as our partners. We also consult closely with the trustees, and we appreciate the time they have devoted to understanding our restructuring plan and other critical issues. Their mature business judgment is a major asset. I've led AIG now for eight months, almost eight months, and I want to assure you that the people at AIG today are working as hard as we can to serve our policyholders, our customers, and taxpayers. We need your help as well. It's critical to remember that we are partners. When we at AIG make mistakes, we expect to be criticized. But rampant, unwarranted criticism of AIG serves only to diminish the value of our businesses around the world, the businesses we are attempting to sell to repay the American taxpayer. We continue to welcome a frank and open dialogue with Congress so that you can be in a position to support our efforts. This support is essential and will benefit AIG's stakeholders, the American taxpayer most of all. We cannot control the market conditions that will partly determine the timing of AIG's restructuring, but we are confident that our approach is right and that if we do this together, we can demonstrate to the world that responsible government and capitalism still strive in the United States. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I'm happy to answer questions that you or the committee might have. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your, your testimony. You know, AIG has um, received over $180 billion in uh, financial 
assistance and the like. Can you provide this committee with assurances that AIG will not require any additional federal money? Uh, Congressman, the assurance I can give you is we will do everything we can to not require additional federal money. But the answer to that question, as I said in my prepared remarks, is so dependent upon what happens to the world economic conditions and perhaps more particularly the world financial markets. We think the money that's been dedicated to us thus far, that's $40 billion of TARP money and approximately $43 billion of Federal Reserve borrowings, when coupled with another $30 billion of TARP, just under $30 billion of TARP, uh, that, that is available to us and the balance of the Federal Reserve borrowing, we think in today's marketplace that is sufficient and we will not need additional money. But that answer is very dependent upon what happens to the overall economic conditions and financial marketplace around the globe. Well, can you assure us that the taxpayers will get their money back? Uh, again, I will assure you we are doing everything we can. We have what we think is a, is, a, is a terrific plan, a viable plan that's not as dependent on the capital markets uh, as, as other plans might have been. But asset values have to stay strong. There has to be a capital market that enables us to take businesses public. I think that will happen, but I can't give you a guarantee on that. I can't control what happens in the worldwide financial marketplace. Does Project Destiny provide that the taxpayers will recover? the 100 percent of their money? It does. Project Destiny, uh, as you indicated in your remarks, basically provides a strategy for each business that comprises AIG. And if the, marketplaces, if the marketplace holds the way it is right now, we think that the American taxpayer will be fully repaid. Again, that is very conditioned upon the assumption that the world economy and the world financial markets stay where they are or improve as opposed to deteriorate. Right. Last week um, I wrote to you requesting a copy of your plan for the future of AIG called Project Destiny. Your outside lawyers sent me a letter on, on Monday saying it was too sensitive to give to the committee and you were discussing it with the New York feds. Um, what is, uh, are you trying to hide something? I mean, why can't we get it? No, I, I'm, I'm prepared to share with you the broad brushstrokes of that plan. Uh, for as long as you'd like. When we get into the operating details, that is commercially sensitive material. There's a lot of people with whom we compete in the United States and around the globe, and to the extent they have access to that information, it would impair our ability to sell, to operate those assets and sell those assets for the benefit of the taxpayer. Right. Let me ask one other question. Uh, who's in charge of AIG? You are New York Feds. Uh, AIG is a shareholder-owned company, and we operate according to that. The largest single shareholder we have is the American public uh, through an 80 percent ownership. The Federal Reserve is, uh, and the U.S. Treasury are our partners. We don't do anything without reviewing it with them, making certain that they are in concurrence with it. So it is very much a partnership uh, in terms of the way we think about uh, making decisions. Right. So let me, um, for the record, Mr. Liddy, I want your commitment that you will provide us a copy of Project Destiny by the close of the business day. Uh, I'll talk to my lawyers about it, sir. I, don't, uh, I, I want to provide you everything that you need to understand Project Destiny. But we're told, and the Federal Reserve has asked us to be very careful with what amount of detail we describe, because that information, as I said, could be very commercially sensitive in the hands of our competitors, and it could destroy our ability to pay back the American taxpayer. So if you will let me please consult with our attorneys about what we can do with that, we will work with you and your staff to provide you what is feasible as quickly as we can. Yeah. You know, that sort of goes to a comment that was made by the ranking member. You know, um, you know, we are talking about transparency. I mean, in some instances, you know, some of this we just can't quite understand why, you know, we can't have it or why we... I mean, that's, you know, and I, I want you to know that that's a big issue as we walk the street. You know, people are saying that they're doing things in secrecy. Uh, they're talking about the bonuses that uh, people are getting. And I think that that's something that you have to be concerned about in terms of the image of, of AIG as well. I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to it, sir. And that's why we, we share with the Federal Reserve and the United States Treasury everything that we're doing. There are no secrets. Everything that we are doing, we share with them. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable that if all of the operating details of our project destiny 
were to uh, be made public that it would put us at a severe disadvantage in terms of trying to realize value for the benefit of the American taxpayer. Do you honestly believe that you have a right to prevent Congress from reviewing how the taxpayer's money is being spent? No. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm delighted. I will share as much of the, the overall broad brush strokes as I possibly can, and I think that that will satisfy you. It's the operating details of that plan that I am more concerned about. All right. All right. Thank you. My time has expired. Yield to the ranking member from California. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. And, and I would have let you go on as long as you wanted to. You were doing extremely well. Mr. Liddy, I'm going to pick up where the Chairman left off because I think he's on the right track. Did you share this project in its entirety with individuals working for the New York Fed or Treasury? Yes, we did. And was that in camera? And if so, how did you make that uh, determination that what you shared with them was not going to be shared with your competitors? Well, the, the Federal Reserve is, is present at every one of our strategic discussions, at all of our board meetings and all of our committee meetings. Uh, no, I appreciate what you're saying, but let me move to the point. The point is, they're not stockholders. They're sitting as members of the board, members of your executive committee. They're operating your company in the sense that they're insiders. I sit on the board of a public company even today. I'm very familiar with the fact that what you're telling us you can't give us, and you did tell us you couldn't give it to us because you said you'd give us the broad brush, the overview. Basically, you said, I won't share with you what I'm sharing with the Treasury. I'm going to ask you in a different way. I know you're going to talk to your lawyers, and Mr. Boggs back there is about the best in town, so maybe you just reach over your shoulder when you get a chance. Will you, given the same protections from disclosure to your competitors, make available to Congress the information? I understand the information is insider information, and people who have access to it need to understand they can't trade in the stock, they can't do other investments. Given those assurances, will you make that available to designated people from Congress? Congressman, I will talk to my lawyer. Tommy's shaking his head at, no. So. At, some, at some point in time, so, and he'll tell me what, what we okay. can and cannot do and what we should and should not do. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, can we suspend for a moment to give him a chance to talk to counsel? be delighted to do so. Yes. May continue. Uh, am I, uh, Congressman, there, there is commercially sensitive material in there. Uh, my attorney advises me we will work with you to provide everything that we possibly can. The material that goes to the Fed or Treasury goes pursuant to a confidentiality agreement. And what we are concerned about is if it goes to Congress, does it give free access to our competitors? If we can find a solution to that, I, and, and I we appreciate can provide that. It so I'll rephrase the question for counsel. Assuming that we provide for in camera, for lack of a better term, review by individuals who have signed on to the confidentiality agreement a limited amount, not Congress as a whole, are you prepared to turn over to this committee's designated people for their evaluation? And we would presume that we'll probably have knowledgeable people outside. Yes. This. The answer is yes? Yes. I, again, exactly the way you worded it, as long as we can get assurances that it doesn't go beyond that group. Okay. Well, the chairman and I, I'm sure, will work together to find a way to make that happen because it is important that this branch of government have the same transparency as the other branch of government currently has on your government-owned entity. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me just go through one or two more quick things. Uh, if I read the arithmetic roughly right, 80% uh, of your company was bought for $40 billion by converting preferred to common. Is that roughly right? Uh, Yes, except then another $30 billion or just under $30 billion is available if we need it. So you need to decide whether you want to include that in the calculation or not. But that would, that would further dilute the stock. Well, it would keep the ownership at, at 80 percent. Okay, so... So you, you don't go above the 79.9. Okay, so getting to mark to market, if we will, what is the uh, current value of your stock as an enterprise, your, your market cap? Uh, it would be a 
approximately five to six billion dollars. So we spent forty billion, agreed to spend seventy billion to five by five billion. Well, it's five billion plus what it can be worth at the end if, if the project destiny execution goes well and the marketplace cooperates. Oh, but you're a publicly so, traded company, so you're worth what you're worth on a given day. Your your classic mark to market justification. You're to, worth five billion today. If if I went into the market to buy I wouldn't have to pay $30 billion to get no more. I wouldn't have to pay $70 billion to get 79%. I would pay a fraction of that if I bought into the other side of the, the equation. Is that right? Yes. The, the, the company is worth, as you say, the company is worth about 5 to $6 billion. Okay. Additionally, and it's the, the last point I'll make on the finances, uh, the, the government lowered your rate to uh, LIBOR plus one, roughly. Uh, or no, LIBOR plus three. You're, you're, you're three and a half, four percent cost of money on a big part of what the government's loaned you. Is that right? Yes. So the government is making money because we borrow for less than that, but that's commercially, what, less than half of what you would normally in your financial condition borrow at. Is that right? Yes. I don't know whether half is the right number, but it's substantially less than, than what the rate would be if we were trying to borrow. Well, BB&T's preferreds now are trading at par at nine percent. So. Right. You know, you're, you're, you're getting about half that. Yes, so the government is not less. losing money on the loan, but in fact, you're getting a preferential uh, treatment, which hopefully comes back in the stock. Correct. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I hope we have a second round, but I, I beg your We uh, will. Thank we you will for have a second round. We will. A yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Konjorski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Lee. Good morning. Uh, since you last appeared before Congress, and that was several months ago, at that time you had indicated that when you took command of AIG, it had counterparty obligations of approximately $2.7 trillion, and that you would reduce that to approximately $1.7 trillion at the last time you testified. Could you give us any indication where that exposure is today? Yes. Uh, at its zenith, that number was $2.7 trillion. At the end of the first quarter, it was at the end of April, it was down just below $1.5 trillion. So we continue to make progress. We continue to make good progress. Do, do, do you have any uh, uh, time frame in mind as to when you will get down to the level that there will not be systemic risk exposure to the taxpayers of the United States? I, I do. We, we are, first, we'd like to make progress in that every single month and every single quarter. But we think by the end of the year that that $1.7 trillion and the 27,000 trades that exist will be materially smaller. The challenge is if you, if you go too fast, you wind up settling those trades at a disadvantage to us and therefore it costs the American taxpayer more. So trying to do that with a little balance in the system is appropriate. We think we can get the right balance and make material progress by the end of the year. Right. Thank you. Uh, did I detect in your response to the chairman and the ranking member in regard to providing your uh, bailout plan or your uh, plan of uh, final execution that you have recorded or indicated the exposure to Federal Reserve and Treasury but have not made it available to the committee staff. Is that because you may uh, be suspicious of the congressional billboard company that we have here, here in the Hill? No, no, it's no. It, it reflects really just my concern that, that if that information gets out, and gets in the hands of our competitors, and it tells them what our roadmap is to, to, to resolve AIG's difficulties, that they will use it against us, and it will make it even harder to achieve the success that we want to achieve. It's, it's as simple as that. I'm not criticizing your judgment. No, I got it. The humor of my chairman and the ranking member. Uh, the one thing I'm interested in, you can be very helpful to us. You know I'm involved in another committee, and we're writing uh, and deciding on what we're going to do with the insurance industry. And when you analyze AIG, you recognize, for all intents and purposes, it was a wonderful and very successful insurance company, except it had some people call rogue organizations or offshore organizations, the London Group, the Financial Products Division of AIG in London. Uh, they were really the organization that, in getting involved in uh, taking positions as counterparties, that they made the great opportunity of risk uh, and uh, uh, weren't the best uh, uh, purchaser of those uh, documents or uh, situations. Now, that was not regulated, I take it, very stringently by your New York State regulators. Is that correct? 
the, the financial products business was not regulated by, by any of the insurance regulators because it wasn't an insurance subsidiary. It was regulated by the uh, OTS. Okay. Now, does OTS have a history or real experience with regulating that type of offshore operation to high success in your estimation? Uh, I, I think not. I think the last time I was before Congress, uh, I was part of a panel that included the interim director of the OTS, and I think he, he said as much. They simply lacked the, the capacity and, and the ability to, to adequately supervise businesses that were in Wilton, Connecticut, London, Paris, uh, Tokyo, what have you, dealing in these very complicated financial instruments. After nine months now, I, that's a short period of time, relatively speaking, to get the total lay of the land or to understand the culture. But would you feel qualified to render an opinion at this point that looking at the existence of not only AIG but several insurance companies that have the opportunities to do what they did in getting into the offshore operation in London and getting into derivatives, do, do, you, do you have any opinion as to whether or not it would be helpful and more protective to the American taxpayer to avoid uh, uh, their exposure and to the economy to avoid systemic risk? if in some way we developed a federal insurance charter that would be a regulator of that operation and much more closely involved than the present regulators have been? Do you have a, a can, you, can you render that opinion first? Uh, I, and if I you can, can give, will you? I can give you some preliminary thoughts. I, I don't know if it's a federal insurance regulator as much as there needs to be someone who looks at systemic risk across large organizations. So a, in my judgment, AIG should not, it should have been a great, the great insurance company it was, and it should have stuck to that knitting. It should not have gone off into the financial products world. Once it did, I think it would have been helpful if there was um, an overseer or a regulator. Once a company gets to a certain size or engages in certain kinds of products, that company ought to be subject to some, some, some broad brushstroke regulation, which I think right now does not exist. I saw that uh, the uh, individual, Sheila Bear, who heads up the FDIC, had a proposal where you'd bring together the, the heads of the Federal Reserve and, and Treasury and, and FDIC, and they would share common knowledge about which institutions perhaps are engaging, either are too large or have too much systemic risk, or are engaging in practices that could cause difficulty. That struck me as a sensible way of using the current regulatory environment, but getting more emphasis on those businesses that simply have become either too large or are engaging things that are outside of their, of their core skills. I think you're referring to Senator Collins' proposal in the Senate. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought it was, I, I don't know. I thought when I first read it, I thought it was a part of an FDIC, part of Sheila Bear's recommendation, but I, I, I could have that entirely wrong. A gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Bill Bray from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman was rightfully saying the concerns of transparency and uh, how far we can go with that. Um, it just sort of reminded me of the fact that if you were, had a uh, proposal for major bonuses for your executives, um, a proposal that had billions of dollars out there, would you ever propose to present them with that, uh, that argument at midnight and then expect them to vote on the commitment um, within, by noon the next day? No, I think I'd, my, my approach generally is to provide people the information they need in order to make an informed judgment. Would you think that um, the uh, 12 hours for a thousand page proposal would be appropriate time for consideration? Well, as, as I said, we're, um, I, I want to work with the Congress. I want to work with, with what you've asked for. I just want to make sure that I protect the interests of the American taxpayer at the back end of this process. Okay, I'm just. I just pointed out, I, frankly, is that the representatives of the taxpayers, we, we were actually asked by our um, chief administrative officer to, uh, of Congress to ask us to vote to make that kind of commitment within that short a period of time, um, where I don't think any, any executive for any company would ask their board of directors to do that, but we were asked to do that, and that's when all hell broke loose when they realized there was a whole lot in that proposal that wasn't there. I understand. I, this issue of of hyperinflation coming down the pike is something we haven't talked about. And I just want to sort of get reassured that with all the hyper spending that we're seeing the federal government do in the last few months and the projections we're going to continue to do it, most economists feel there's a great threat that we'll go into hyperinflation. If hyperinflation kicks in, 
um, what is the what is the results on our payback? Now, I assume that we will not be going dollar for dollar. It will be value to some degree. But it will it be dollar to dollar? And will we then, will hyperinflation then reduce the net value of what we're paid back to the, to the Treasury? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a very difficult one to answer because hyperinflation would, it would be accompanied by a lot of other factors. So you'd have to kind of go through a string of events. What would hyperinflation unleash? You know, if you own real assets, fixed assets in a hyperinflationary period, that can be a good thing because the value of those goes up, but there's nobody around that has any money in order to buy it. So you'd really have to step back and, and look at it. You know, our, our plan takes uh, anywhere from three to five years to fully unfold, uh, given current market conditions. How quickly a hyperinflation scenario, if it were to occur, how quickly it would occur, don't know. So we could be well down the path towards realizing the, the repayment of, of the American taxpayer before any hyperinflationary uh, situation were to occur. So in other words, you're hoping to be able to pay back the taxpayers before the ceiling falls in on the, the inflationary spiral? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to make uh, some major inroads into repaying the American taxpayer. And I'm not so sure the ceiling falls in. As I said, there's hyperinflation will be one element. There could be a, a host of other things that some offsetting that come with that. OK, here's the catch. Question, follow up question here is how long do you anticipate AIG to take to pay off that the debt to the taxpayers? Well, I think it'll take somewhere between between three and five years. Uh, and what makes the answer so difficult is in formulating a response, you have to make a judgment about how strong will the, will the economy be worldwide and how good will the capital markets be worldwide. If they stay about where they are or get better, it's that three to five year time frame. If they were to get worse, it could get elongated. Uh, has the administration given any guidelines on when to start repaying AIG's debt? They have not given us any guidelines. We work with the Federal Reserve. Uh, anytime we, we use any of the dollars that have been allocated to us, we have to get a waiver from the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's our intent to try to start repaying that as quickly as possible. As I mentioned in my, in my oral testimony, we, we want to take some of our largest assets, put them in a special purpose vehicle. When we do that, the amount of debt that we've uh, borrowed from the Federal Reserve will be reduced proportionately. So we could do that in, in, in a matter of months, assuming we can get all of the regulatory approvals for these special purpose vehicles done in that time frame. To what extent has the Federal, the federal Reserve officials been involved in the strategy of how to pay back this? They've been very involved in it. As I said, we don't, they, I, I treat them as a full partner. We don't do anything so without getting involved them involved. So they're involved in day-to-day -day decisions involved here, or is it just general policy? No, I, I wouldn't say day-to-day -day decisions. I would say more strategy uh, and policy. Sometimes it's hard to tell when you move from strategy to a policy to a decision. But we just don't, we don't want them to be caught off guard by anything that we're working on. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Congressman Cummings from... Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lee, good morning. Good morning. Ms. Lee, um, first of all, I want to thank you for your comments about um, being concerned about the taxpayers. Uh, we too are concerned. And I heard your comments about criticism. Uh, let me say this that when anyone's getting $182 billion of taxpayers' money, many of those taxpayers who have lost their jobs, savings, uh, health insurance, uh, you're going to get some criticism no matter what. Um, but let me go to something that Mr. Bernanke said, Fed Chair Bernanke said just a week ago when he was talking about um, pay. And he said he had no problem with um, people receiving high pay paychecks. He said, but there should be a pay system that prevents excessive risk taking and at the same time is directly related to performance. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, I do. And are you, so, and I know that you have come under, uh, well, AIG has come under criticism for these retention payments and the bonuses and whatever. Um, uh, what is being done consistent with Bernanke's statement that I just quoted to uh, address that issue, if anything? Um, it's a great question, Congressman. I, Thank I would, you. I, I would, I would say um, the the most important thing we can do is not allow a situation like AIG FP to ever get started again. So in AIG FP, the participants in in that in that business 
generally got 30 to 35 percent of the profits. That, that can encourage some risk taking that simply is out of bounds. So the winding down of FP and the comp programs we have in place up there right now are not nearly as lucrative. They are specifically targeted at you get paid if you achieve certain objectives. So I think that is right on point with uh, Chairman Bernanke's view that there's got to be a, a risk reward and a pay for performance standpoint. So I, th I think we are making good progress on that. In the basic insurance operations uh, at AIG, we've almost all had that. You know, that is much more traditional looking in terms of the leverage that there is on a bonus plan, uh, how much of a relationship there is between a base salary and a performance-based bonus, and they are very performance-based. So in most areas of AIG, I, th I think we are in pretty good shape. It was more in the AIG FP area where I think the compensation systems got out of bounds. So uh, let me make sure I understand. Now, we had, we had it in, in more, we had bonuses and retention payments, I think, in more than just FP, right? Yes, I, I was trying to respond to, your, to right. the, the specific part of Mr. Bernanke's comment that there ought to be a trade-off between risks and rewards. All right. Um, now, what can the American people expect uh, as owners of 79 percent of this company with regard to bonuses and retention payments in, say, the next year? After all, and I'm going to say this over and over again wherever I go, they're losing their jobs, their homes, they're losing everything. And so they don't, they don't have, they have no sympathy for AIG. So I'm just wondering, what can you tell them? They're watching you about, uh, you know, what they can expect to see as they're seeing the foreclosure signs go up in front of their houses. What do they expect to see in the New York Times and the Washington Post about bonuses and retention payments at AIG? Uh Specifically with retention payments, we are trying to recast as many of those as we can to make them performance-based so that you have to earn them, not simply stay for a certain period of time. Uh, uh, as I am told, there are Treasury regulations which will be forthcoming uh, that will be very specific about how much you can pay, what, what base salaries are, what bonuses can be, how they will be, how those bonuses can be paid. As soon as we get that material, we will revise our comp systems to be in 100 percent compliance with those regulations. Last question. Did AIG write swaps on any debt held by creditors to General Motors or Chrysler? And if so, what can you tell me about those swaps? I don't know. I, I, I saw that, that question someplace, and I, I just don't have any information on it. It is be, a very important question. I'd be delighted to get the information. and, and, and How soon do you think we can get it? Uh, we'll do it as quickly as we can, sir. Yeah, we want to look into that very carefully. Um, and let, let me ask you this. What, when, on January 15th, you told me in my, uh, when we met that you expected to be able to uh, pay back the debt by Janu by, within five years. Um, at that time, of course, I didn't know that uh, AIG would have its largest loss in, in the history of any company in the world, quarterly loss. What do you, what's your projection today? Uh, as I answer this, uh, the Congressman over here, I think the answer is three to five years. But it is very dependent upon what happens to the capital markets. And that loss, as I've attempted to explain in, in the past to many of you, that loss had two major components. One was worldwide asset values plummeted in the fourth quarter. When asset values go down, we have to reflect that loss in our P&L. That's what drove that loss. Second. When you're, when you're worried about the components of your business, you have things like goodwill and deferred tax assets, you aren't going to be able to realize those, you write them off. Those two things alone were the major drivers of that loss. I think the answer, we will be able to repay the taxpayer in that three to five year time frame, but it is heavily dependent upon what happens uh, uh, with the worldwide economic situation, the success of the stimulus programs that all of the world's governments are, are bringing to bear, and the condition of the financial markets. We, we are not an island, and those issues play such a large role in our ability to make progress paying back the taxpayer. The gentleman's time has expired. I yield five minutes to Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you decide to start a sub subcommittee on oversight of AIG, I will volunteer to serve on it. <laughs> it's Ms. good Liddy, to know. Mr. Liddy, thank you for coming. Uh, you're in a tough, difficult position. I understand you're basically not paid for this. You've taken this on to uh, restructure the company. 
Uh, in that regard, I, I appreciate your willingness to do it. You very much understand, though, the cynicism with which uh, very often your testimony is met because of the pent-up anger, particularly in Congress, but uh, more specifically among the American people, about uh, the reckless actions of this company previously. And in that regard, uh, I'd like to take a step back, if we could, and, and trace a process by starting with uh, just a general question. Can you explain to the American people who is AIG? You were formerly organized as a thrift holding company. The various business components of that, the business sector or one of those uh, components that went bad in terms of the creation of exotic financial instruments, and then how are you suggesting a restructuring of the company and management to deal with it? Sure. Um, AIG consists of, uh, of, a, of a number of component parts, and let's just think about it as a string. There are property casualty businesses. There are worldwide life and savings businesses. There are domestic life and savings businesses. There's a couple of, of large businesses like International Lease Finance. I think we own more airplanes than any other entity in the world. Uh, and in, that, in that, that general area, there's also the, the AIG financial products. So most of what I've tried to describe very briefly just now is it's an insurance company, with a few exceptions. One of those large exceptions was, starting in about 1987 or so, uh, AIG got into a, uh, a, a non-insurance business called AIG Financial Products, FP for short, and that's where we wrote very sophisticated derivatives, credit default swaps, hedges, and things of that nature. The um, credit default swaps generally performed well until the complete liquidity collapse that occurred uh, in 07. Many of the credit default swaps, the multi-sector credit default swaps that were written by AIG were tied to the housing market. When the housing market collapsed, those credit default swaps called for the posting of collateral. We had to keep ensuring the value of those, uh, of those instruments, and we ran into a severe liquidity squeeze. That's when the Federal Reserve and the United States Treasury came forward. Uh, and the first uh, rescue package was essentially a loan of up to $85 billion extended to us by the Federal Reserve. Uh, while that solved one problem, it created another problem because we didn't have enough equity to support the $85 billion. So that then was subsequently redone to Im include a balance of equity from TARP and debt from the Federal Reserve. Uh, you stated that the default swaps performed well. Uh, that's However, the reserves underlying the risk to manage those default swaps were clearly not there, which begs the earlier question about the overall structure in which AIG was uh, operating under, a thrift holding company and the lack of regulato regulatory oversight there. Yeah, as you know, Congressman, I, I was not there. I've been at the helm for, for eight months, and, and so my, my time and energy is focused on today and tomorrow and less on yesterday. What I do appreciate after being on the job for almost eight months is I don't think the financial products business belonged attached to AIG in any way, shape, or form. And so when, when Congressman Kanjorski asked me the question uh, about oversight, I, I think there needs to be substantially greater oversight of financial institutions. Maybe we can do that within the existing regulators to make sure that those that are either very large or pose systemic risk really get monitored on a regular basis so you can't have this kind of event occur again. Let's quickly move to an issue of the bonuses. We were told earlier it was $120 million in 2008. New information has come out that it is $450 million. How, wh why the discrepancy? Um, we apologize for any confusion. We are asked so many questions on bonuses, and each person wants it sliced a slightly different way. The first question we were asked was corporate bonuses. To us, that means bonuses paid at the corporate center or paid from the corporation. That was the $121 million. We were then asked a separate question, a subsequent question, well, how many bonuses were paid corporate-wide, anywhere in the company, worldwide, in Japan, in South America, whatever? That's a different question, and that's the larger number. So we're, we're trying to slice the information in accordance with each individual request that we get. We get them from Congress, we get them from the Senate, we get them from regulators and from the Fed and Treasury. Uh, we're being as cooperative as we can. Sometimes we're drowning in requests. 
Uh, back to the earlier question about your plans for management restructuring. For management restructuring, we divided the business into three categories, the three largest and most valuable businesses that we have. Uh, we intend to uh, take public or sell a minority stake in. That will generate much of the funds we need in order to repay the taxpayer. Uh, some of the businesses will be held uh, and, and will wait for a better day to sell them. Uh, another section of the businesses may be a part of AIG going forward. It will take us, we think, three to four to five years if the marketplace stays where it is today or gets better in order to repay the, uh, the taxpayer, but we have a strategy to do exactly that. The gentleman's time has expired. You, I yield now five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm asking these questions on behalf of my constituents in Ohio who are policemen, firemen, teachers, and other public employees in Ohio who AIG defrauded, defrauded their pension funds. These are people who uh, protect our neighborhoods, teach our children, dedicate themselves to public service, and AIG cheated them out of $96 million. Now, AIG has admitted on multiple occasions through guilty pleas and restatements of 24 transactions that the company defrauded investors and lied to regulators. My question to Mr. Liddy, does your business plan include settlement of lawsuits against AIG for bid rigging, accounting fraud, and market manipulation of AIG stock prices? We know that you paid uh, $800 million settlement to the SEC and $375 million to the New York Attorney General. Uh, and, and if it does include it, um, why, after receiving $85 billion on September 16, 2008, and after you assuming the duties of CEO of AIG on September 18, 2008, why is it that AIG has cut off communications, cut off communications with representatives of a class action, which includes police, fire, teachers, and other public employees in Ohio whose pension funds AIG defrauded? And how can you tell this committee that, could that those eight months which have passed, which are contemporaneous with you becoming CEO, that, that you did not direct AIG to basically stall and, uh, and continue the defrauding of these public employees in Ohio? Mr. Con Liddy. Congressman, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just am not familiar with all the particulars of the particular suit that you have just well, referenced. Well, let, me, uh, let me help I'll you. On March the 26th, you sat in front of a financial services committee this issue was asked. I want the members of this committee to follow this now. You were asked about this before. You told the committee, you'll look into it. Do everything you can to make sure it gets resolved. Now, you said you would do everything on March 26. This is after people had already been waiting for months to hear whether their pensions were going to be secure. Can you name one thing, just name one thing that you've done to get this matter resolved with respect to the defrauding of policemen, firemen, teachers and public employees in the state of Ohio defrauding their pension fund. Can you name one thing that you as the CEO have done about it, this? Anything involving legal settlements or legal challenges, I depend upon our, our very substantial legal department to resolve. I believe that they have been in either negotiation or contacts. I don't know. We will meet with you. I will personally meet with you to make sure that we, well, we advance th the situation. Th that's fine. I want the committee to be aware of this. AIG repaid counterparties one-to-one. -one. Counterparties in England, in Germany, in France. What, dollar for dollar, you repaid them. But when it comes to police and fire and teachers in Ohio, zero for the dollars they invested. This is during your watch. You can't say this is about some other CEO. This is not acceptable, Mr. Liddy. You cannot get $182 billion, as my friend Mr. Cummings pointed out, and then say, well, we want to be spared criticism. Yes, this is criticism. AIG cheated police, fire, teachers, and public employees in Ohio out of $96 million. That may not seem like a lot of money to a firm that's used to dealing in trillions. 
but you cheated people who save lives, who teach our children, and I want to know right now what you're going to do about it. What are you going to do about this? As I said, I, I'll, we will meet. I'll meet with you right after this meeting if you'd like, and we can begin to understand exactly where we are. I just don't have the information on it. All of the things that you've mentioned, I, I'm very sensitive to them. They did all occur before my watch, but I'm prepared to take responsibility to decide whether they should be resolved, and if so, how. Well, you know, we know that two other parties have already been settled in the class action case, Price Waterhouse and General uh, Reinsurance Corp. Do you just feel that when it comes to public employees, you can roll them? You can just dismiss them? Is this your attitude? You haven't resolved this, Mr. Liddy, on your watch. We will work with you and do everything we can to get it resolved, Mr. Sir. Liddy, I'm the chairman of the subcommittee on domestic policy. And until this matter is resolved, you are going to keep getting called in front of Congress to explain why it's okay for AIG to cheat police, firemen, teachers, and public employees. I'm not going to let you go, Mr. Liddy. And I'll talk to you after the meeting, but you're not going to roll this member, guaranteed. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm not. We'll get together after the meeting. We'll do everything we can to make sure that we, we resolve it. Uh, you as said that on March 26th. I have your quote. Not good, Mr. Liddy, God bless you. Thanks for being here. But there's a moment here of truth, and you are going to have to remember these police, fire, and teachers. Mr. Chairman, I came to this Congress not to represent these people on Wall Street who have been shafting the American people. I came here to represent my constituents, and that's who I'm speaking on behalf of right now. Not going to let you go. Not going to let you get away with it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Five Chairman. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Liddy, uh, thank you for coming back before Congress. I know this is uh, one of the more, full, more joyful days of your life. Um, when did you receive the uh, honor uh, of being CEO of AIG? When did I? Yes. Uh, middle of September. September 18th, I think, was the date. S September 18th. Okay. And in, in the whole run-up, there's a Washington Post story today, which I'm sure uh, you caught um, this morning about AIG, entitled Officials Knew of AIG Bonuses Month Before Firestorm. Now, I just want to touch on this. I don't want to uh, you, – you've received uh, enough in the way of questions on this, and I think you've answered everything to the fullest extent you, you could. But uh, documents show that senior officials at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York received details about the bonuses more than five months before the firestorm erupted and were deeply engaged with AIG as well as outside lawyers, auditors, and public relations firms about the potential controversy. But the New York Fed did not raise the alarm with the Obama administration until the end of February. So interestingly enough, so the New York Fed was very engaged and, and well informed on, on this matter. Um, uh, long before it, it came to public lie. Is that true? Yes, the, the uh, AIG FP bonuses were a topic of great uh, consideration uh, starting in about the end of October or beginning of November. Was the chairman of the Federal Reserve of the Bank of New York in, uh, informed of these bonuses? Uh, I, I can't answer that. We, we Did deal you have with a conversation with the chairman of the, of the Federal Reserve of the Bank of New York? No, I did not. I, I don't think so. In the fall, you never had a discussion with? The conversations, as I remember them, would have been more with the people that we interface with at the Federal Reserve on a regular basis. Uh, but that would not, if you mean by chairman, if you mean, mean Chairman Bernanke, no, there would have been no conversation okay. with him. Uh, uh, and I, I don't think uh, there was any. What about the head of the, uh, uh, the New York Fed? Yeah, I just don't recall who, who the conversations were with. Did you have any uh, any conversations in the fall with Timothy Geithner? Not in the fall, I don't believe so, no. Okay, so you had no conversations. Uh, uh, Mr. Geithner had pretty much recused himself from many of these activities because he was uh, either they were considering him for the spot of the Treasury Secretary or, or he had already been nominated. Well, when some of these actions uh, took place that there wasn't even a, a president-elect at the time. So you, you didn't have any conversations with Timothy Geithner during September or October of last year? I, not, on the, not on this topic. I don't remember that, but I'd, I'd have to go back and check. I don't think so, no. Okay. If you, could, if you could submit that to the committee, I'd certainly appreciate it. 
uh, and it, so you're saying you didn't have any, uh, apparently you're saying you didn't have any conversations with them whatsoever? Oh, on, on bonuses you mean or in general? Did you have any, if you listen to me specifically here, did you have any conversations with a Mr. Timothy Geithner in September, October, November, or December of last year? Yes, I would say uh, in October or November um, preceding the revision of the original bailout program, I would have met with Mr. Geithner. Did you have a, any mention of the word bonus with Mr. Geithner? No. Thank Not you. in those meetings, no. Uh, did you have any discussion with Mr. Geithner in September, October, November, or December in any way, shape, or form regarding anything to do with the word bonus or what a bonus means? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you. I'm not an attorney, but it's, it I seems a little slippery the way you're trying to answer this, so I want to make sure we have that on the record. Recent data about commercial... Uh, real estate uh, predictions uh, for this coming year and the following year. This is the substance of what I'd like to talk about, and I'm sorry we had to belabor that. Um, and it was painful for me as well to try to ask that question and get a direct answer from you. But increasing vacancies, we have a, a discussion about uh, uh, the real estate in industry in, in specifically with the commercial real estate industry uh, this year and next regarding increasing vacancies and uh, perhaps loan defaults as liquidity for refinancing uh, remains very scarce. Uh, we see a lot of, uh, of troubles in the CMBS market, obviously. Can you talk about AIG's commercial real estate portfolio and loan exposure and how you think this portfolio will hold up if it were subjected to a, a, a stress test style of assessment that the, the, the 19 largest banks went through. If you could touch on the commercial uh, real estate and your loan portfolio and your exposure there. Uh, we have a substantial commercial real estate uh, portfolio, either in owned real estate or in uh, CMBSs, as, as you refer to them. Uh, those things lost substantial value in the fourth quarter, and, and our write-down of those, in fact, was what contributed to our very large loss in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, I'm, I'm worried about that portfolio and worried about real estate in general. If there's a lack of economic activity, I think it does not bode well for commercial uh, real estate at all. If the stimulus money that's being brought to bear on our economic travails does in fact work, then I think we could work our way out of that. I, do, I don't have a sense of what that timing would be. But I think commercial mortgages and CMBSs in general, which a lot of insurers invest in because they're long-dated liabilities that match long-dated assets that match their long-dated liabilities, I think that those asset classes could be under some stress for a while. The gentleman's time Thanks. has expired. You have five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Congressman Turney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Liddy, for being here with us today. Um, let me ask you, about November of 2008, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York established Maiden Lane 3, a uh, financing agency. And it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it was that agency uh, that provided the money for AIG to then go out and purchase some of the underlying subprime securities? Yes. About $27 billion, a little more than $27 billion. Yes. Now, you did that and then you canceled the contracts that you had with those uh, counterparties, am I right? Yes. Okay. Would you provide copies of those contracts to this committee? Uh, the Federal Reserve would have to do that because the Federal Reserve did that. So let, let me just explain. Uh, while we were the counterparty, we would fight tooth and nail with them. Once the Federal Reserve decided that we would put money into a, a financing entity, a, a special purpose vehicle, then the Federal Reserve took over the responsibility for the negotiation of those settlements and the cancellation of the contracts. They would have to provide those. So they, the they kind of purpose, took them all. All right, thank you. The special purpose entity, we explain to me how that was structured. AIG put in the equity. AIG sold the assets, the underlying assets, at some cents on the dollar. I don't remember the exact number, 45 or 50 or 50. To raise the equity? Uh, no, the equity came from money that, that, that the, federal, that the right. U.S. Treasury had, had provided us. But then we sold the assets, and, and the sale of those assets went into, into Maiden Lane 3. Um, so the, I'm, I'm just trying to learn here. So the, the sure. sale of the assets were the subprime it, it, was, it was the underlying assets underlying. that were valued at, as I said, 45 or 50 cents on the dollar. The Federal Reserve then bought them, and that money went into the funding of Maiden Lane 3. Right. Uh, 
the reports are that you paid full value for the uh, subprime securities. Is that accurate? Again, the Federal Reserve did so that. They paid full yeah, value. Yeah, the Federal Reserve it. did that. In fact, we don't even know what, what, what they did because we were out of that process. Okay. The, before that all happened, AIG had been having serious collateral disputes with Goldman Sachs over certain values involved in their portfolios, correct? Oh, it was, it was any counterparty, not just Goldman Sachs. It was any counterparty. Yeah. It gets to the, to the root of mark to market. You and I can look at the same set of, set of facts, and right. you can think it has one value. I could think it has another. I, I, and I guess, Mr. Chairman, if I, I, we would need to go and get those contracts from the Fed. I, the question here, Mr. Liddy, obviously, is why we paid full value when there was legitimate disputes as to the value on that, why we didn't negotiate a, a better arrangement on that. And you're telling us that it's the Fed we should speak to, not you, because you weren't involved in that. Yes, we, we were asked to step aside once those uh, financing vehicles were, were set up, and I believe the Federal Reserve had the uh, responsibility for those. Okay. Now, um, Mr. Kanjorski asked you a question about regulation going forward, and you, uh, you answered on that. Why wouldn't we uh, favor uh, some sort of a, a regulatory system that disallowed uh, entities like this from getting too large and too diverse? as opposed to just having somebody oversee them and sort of watch over them. Uh, why would we go back to something on the nature of Glass-Steagall or that type of operation where we just simply say you can't get that diverse and that large? Do you want to comment on that? You know, I would. Uh, it's, I'm not so sure it's the issue of large. It's a matter of breadth. So you're, if you're in one product line and you're really muscular in it and you're very good at it and you know it, that's one thing. But if you're in 20 different product lines and that's the definition of large, that seems to me to have a different level of risk. So I, I think it's, I think it's a, the, probably the center point for a debate that ought to occur. I just don't think a situation where uh, an, AI, an AIG, a, a really a, a premier insurance company, should have a financial products business attached to it. Thank you for that. You had another $43.7 billion between September of 2008 and December of 2008 uh, that was from the uh, public that used to satisfy uh, financial counterparties uh, with respect to the securities lending uh, operations of AG. Were there any negotiations involved in those payments, or were they contractually obligated for the, the amount that you uh, in, paid? No, that, that's, a, that's a whole different situation. It's where we have to pay a dollar back to somebody who's got our assets. If we want our assets back, we've got to give them a dollar. But the, the, the investments we had invested our dollar in had declined, so it, it's a much different situation than a credit default swap. All right. Would you be able to make those contracts available? I, I assume I, if I will ask our general counsel, and I'm always worried about you know, who's on the other end, and did we, did we sign a confidentiality agreement that we won't make anything available? If you'll give us the time to research whether we can do that, we'll sure. come right back to you. We'll do that. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yields. Gentleman from Arizona, Congressman Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sir Liddy, can you tell us uh, what the administration's plans are moving forward uh, with AIG? I cannot. I, I don't have any idea. I know what, what my, uh, I think I know what my marching orders are, and that is to run the company as well as we can and in a way that is responsible, it gives us a chance to pay back the, uh, the American taxpayer, preserves the jobs, and that's what we're trying to do. Well, great. I, I didn't think you could answer that question. I just asked that to point out that uh, the minority has asked for an administration witness for quite a while. It would be helpful to know what the administration has planned, uh, but we're unable to ascertain that. And I, I appreciate that's not your job to answer that question, but it's just difficult from our side. If we don't know uh, what the administration has planned, and I hope that we have some hearings coming up where we can find that out. I would ask, uh, though, there have been some some talk that uh, that AIG, in its effort to come back, um, is is undercutting competition, uh, offering uh, insurance products under value, um, and and making it difficult for competition. Who are your main competitors? Um, domestically, um, uh, Ace. Well, let me just Ace, Zurich, Oxa, uh, Allianz, Travelers. I would also say that a number of organizations have looked at that issue. The GAO looked at it, and they commented on it the last time I was here before Congress. Um, the Federal Reserve has commissioned uh, its own study of that, and we found we, we just don't do that. We just don't, we don't put the federal money into the property casualty businesses and then use that as a competitive advantage. And I think any analysis that's been done would support that. Brokers have done that same kind of analysis, and, and there doesn't appear to be much validity to it. So any allegation that that is taking place is, has no 
basis in reality? I don't believe so. You know, it's a very competitive marketplace. And, and like most areas of business, people fight tooth and nail. Uh, but in terms of us uh, appropriately or inappropriately pricing our product, we do not do that. What I don't want to do is have this company get out of the mess that it's in and then find out that the book of business that we have is underpriced and we've got insurance issues. We're just not going to do that. Right. Well, you, you can see why some might be concerned about that, though, whenever... Uh uh, government is, is backing someone. We, we've seen it with the, the GSEs. Uh, you, there's simply less care taken. Uh, yes, no, I, I, and, I, and, I understand it 100%. Uh, I, I would, again, I'd say if you look at the, the results, the early results of the GAO study or some work done by the Federal Reserve or work done by brokers, I think you'll find little, if any, validity to that issue. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, you gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Five Mr. minutes. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Liddy, welcome back. Uh, AIG continues to post significant losses uh, despite infusions of taxpayer uh, dollars amounting to over $180 billion. Uh, just last month, AIG experienced a shocking $61.7 billion loss, a quarterly loss, uh, which was the highest in U.S. corporate history. Is AIG really too big to fail, and hasn't it already failed? Well, uh, as I explained earlier, there's, there were reasons for that loss. It had to do with market valuations and then writing off assets on our balance sheet, which we thought did not have as much value as we were carrying them on. Uh, I would point out to you that just last week we reported our results for the first quarter, and that loss was not $62 billion, it was $4.3 billion, which was substantially less than the loss was in the first quarter of 2008. Uh, so we, are, we believe we are making some progress. I, I don't think that AIG has failed. I think, as I've attempted to say in, my, in my, oral, uh, my oral remarks and then here in response to several questions, it's a very complicated institution. Uh, it's a very complicated situation. I think there is, uh, we have a good plan to work our way out of this and hopefully to repay the American taxpayer, but it is heavily dependent upon economic recovery and the capital markets staying where they are or improving. Now, now given these jaw-dropping figures, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that any taxpayer investment uh, in AIG can be equated to throwing money into a bottomless pit. Uh, it appears that taxpayers are simply propping AIG up. Uh, is AIG, in effect, a, a uh, sinkhole? No, as I said, I, I, I don't believe so. I think we have a good plan that we will be able to repay the American taxpayer. Some very vital businesses will emerge from AIG. We'll be a much, a much smaller, more transparent, more, more nimble company. Uh, so I, I would not categorize it as a sinkhole. Let me ask you about the AIG Financial Products Division. Um, did AIG retain any of the executives in its financial products division that ran AIG into the ground? The, the short answer is no. The, the top three or four or five people, the folks that I would say, I, I characterize them as the architects and builders of the multi-sector credit default swap, those people are gone. Do we have people who did credit analysis or trade on securities? Yes, but they weren't the architects and builders and engineers of that, of that program. So, so you are not working with a completely new team at the Financial Products Division? We're working with a completely new leadership team. Many of the folks who are executing on those contracts are the same, but they're executing under different standards and different leadership and different requirements. You know, all of... Uh all of the losses that we've talked about today have occurred under your watch as CEO. Uh, tell, tell the committee what exactly you are doing today that is so different from what you have done in the past few months so that uh, you will, will, will better protect taxpayers' investment in AIG and ensure a return on their investment. Well, we are trying very hard and I think making good progress to wind down the AIG financial products, which posed the systemic risk that we represented to the U.S. financial system. Um, and and we've, made, we've made good progress on it. If asset values continue to go down, we could continue to record losses. Hopefully that does not occur.
Thank you for your answers, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, uh, we have votes on the floor, and what I'd like to do is to recess until 12.15 and return. And of course, that uh, would give us enough time to have the three votes, you know, plus uh, get a drink of water. <laughs> so we will recess until 12.15.